Hello, V. Anton Sprawl here again, talking about how you can learn to think like a programmer. In this video, I'm going to talk about a classic brain teaser and explain how the thought process needed to solve this puzzle is like the thought process needed to solve a programming problem. You see, once you understand the syntax of a programming language reasonably well, the difficulty in programming is all in the problem solving part. And the approaches needed to solve problems are similar no matter what kind of problem we're trying to solve. This is something I talk about in the first couple of chapters of my book, and it's really the key to becoming a good problem solver, and therefore a good programmer. But here's an example I didn't use in the book. Now let me say that this is an old, old puzzle, and you may already know the answer to it. That's fine. You just have to think back to how it was when you first heard the puzzle. Because the important thing is not the answer, but how the answer is found. So here's the puzzle. You're following a recipe that requires exactly two ounces of water. Unfortunately, you don't have anything with the measure for exactly two ounces, or even just one ounce, which of course would also work. What you've got is one cup that holds five ounces and another that holds three ounces. So how can you get the exact measure that you need? Again, you may remember the answer to this. If you don't though, try to figure it out. Pause the video and give yourself a couple of minutes to think about it. All right, did you figure it out? If you didn't, don't feel bad, very few people do. I know I didn't see the answer the first time I heard one of these problems. So here is the answer. To get a measurement of two ounces, we first need to fill the five ounce cup, then fill the three ounce cup from the five ounce cup. Now there will be exactly two ounces left in the five ounce cup. So that's the answer, but here's another question. Why is that puzzle so hard? It's because it involves pouring from one measuring cup to another, and that's something that most people don't even consider. Think about it. What if I had described the problem like this? You've got two cups, one that holds five ounces and one that holds three. By pouring water into the cups from a faucet and by pouring water from one cup into another, how can you measure exactly two ounces? Describing the puzzle that way removes much of the difficulty. So the lesson from this puzzle is that restating the problem another way often makes finding the solution much easier. How does this apply to programming? The sample programming problem I'm going to discuss deals with permutations, so we need to discuss that concept first. To understand what a permutation is, think of a three-digit lock, like you might see on a bike lock or a suitcase. How many different ways are there to set the digits? With three digits, each of which can be set one of ten different ways, there are ten times ten times ten, or one thousand, permutations. It's a little confusing that in official terminology, we call these permutations and not combinations. But in math, a combination is a situation in which the order doesn't matter. Like if you're trying to figure out how many different sandwiches you can make out of the stuff in your refrigerator, a ham and Swiss sandwich is the same as a Swiss and ham sandwich. That's combinations. But if you set the lock to 4-7-2, then you can't open it with 2-4-7 because the order of the digits matters. That's permutations. To get started, let me show you some basic code for displaying all the possible permutations of digits on our three-digit lock. This is in C++, so let me walk through it quickly in case some of you aren't completely comfortable with C++ yet. In C++, counting loops are normally written using four. Inside the parentheses, the section before the first semicolon is where we initialize our looping variable. The next section limits the looping. In this case, we are looping as long as our variable is less than 10. The last section is executed at the end of each pass through the loop. 
In this case, we are incrementing or adding one to our loop variable. So each of these loops runs a different variable from zero up to nine. The loops are nested or placed one inside each other so that each time the outer loop executes once, the loop in the middle executes 10 times, and each time the loop in the middle executes once, the loop inside it executes 10 times. So these things run sort of like an odometer. Inside the innermost loop, we have an output statement. Here's a look at the first part of the output from this program. As you can see, it displays all the possible permutations of the lock. Okay, all of that was just the setup. Here's the actual problem, and it's similar to ones you will often see at programming contests. There is a highly organized city that has decided to assign a number to each of three major departments, fire, police, and sanitation. Each of these departments is going to get a number from one to seven. As you might expect, you can't give the same number to two departments. Furthermore, for some reason, it's required that the sum of all the numbers equals 12. Oh, and the chief of police has an irrational fear of odd numbers and requires that the police department gets an even number. So the problem is to write a program that outputs all the possible valid permutations of department numbers. If you're the sort of programmer that is still struggling with problem solving, this is the kind of problem that can start you sweating. I remember the trouble I had when I first saw this problem. I recognized that it was a permutation problem, and I was comfortable writing the sort of permutation code I just showed you. So I thought about how I could modify that basic nested loop to get the results I needed. But I kept running down dead ends. My first thought was, well, I could run the loops from one to seven. So I did that. As you can see, it's basically the same code, only I've changed the variable names and the loops now go from one to seven instead of zero to nine. But then I remembered that no two department numbers could be the same. So I thought, what if I started each loop on the digit after the current value of the previous loop's variable? That seemed like it would run through all of the possible permutations without ever having the same value for any two variables. I realized I'd be skipping some permutations that way, because it meant that the fire department would always have the lowest number, for example, but maybe I could worry about that later. But then I remembered that the police chief needed an even number for the police department. So I thought I could modify that loop to start at two and increment by two instead of by one. But wait, how am I going to keep the idea of starting each loop one after the position of the previous loop? And I haven't even started thinking about how I was going to get all the numbers to equal 12. I had a vague idea that maybe after computing the numbers for the first two departments, I could just add those together and then subtract that sum from 12 and get the number needed for the sanitation department. But what if the sum of the first two departments was already 12 or greater? I needed some way to stop the middle loop before it went too far. I was in trouble, no doubt about it. It wasn't that I didn't think I could get it to work eventually, but I was looking at a lot of tricky coding, and it was the sort of thing where I worried that even if I managed it, it would take a lot of testing, and I was never going to be 100% confident that my program generated only valid permutations. Then came the Eureka moment. If you want, pause the video and try to think your way through to a simple solution. Here's what I realized. Nothing in the question actually requires that the program generate only valid permutations for the different departments. It just requires that the program outputs only the valid permutations. In other words, what I realized is I could just stick with my original code 
and generate every permutation of the digits 1 through 7, and then before printing out a particular permutation, check to see if it follows all the rules. That program looks like this. As you can see, we generate every permutation of three numbers 1 through 7. But then check to see if the numbers are different. Uh, the sum of the numbers is 12, and the police department number is even. Another advantage of this approach is that we could turn the checking into a function, dividing our labor and making the program a lot easier to read. Now it looks like this. Again, the lesson is, when you are stuck on a problem, ask yourself, what are the things I know how to do? What is the question really asking for? Don't ever assume that the direction that initially seems most obvious is the correct one. And give yourself every opportunity to experiment with other approaches. All right, thanks for listening, and I hope this helps some of you out there. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please subscribe. And if you have ideas for topics or questions, head over to my website for my contact information.